I have special guest Lou Eckes here again. This is the leader of uh, North America, Tropic Marin, dropping all of his knowledge on us. Today, it's actually 10 of the most popular uh, questions that he gets for technical assistance that are not related to Tropic Marin. <laughs> uh, so we'll hold you to that standard today. We'll see. Okay. I'll do my best. <laughs> uh, I, I, I man the phones. I know what this is like, so I can't wait to hear. So number one question is, do I need to do water changes? Yeah, and, and you know, you talk to 10 different people about this question, you're gonna get like 13 different answers. Mm -hmm. um, I'm of the opinion that water changes are good. I don't think you need to do them a 20% water change every two weeks. Maybe not even a 10 or a 20% water change every month. But I also don't think that you should never do a water change. Um, I look at it this way. I know that when I had my reef tank, I'm too busy now, I don't have a reef tank anymore. But um, when I had my reef tank for so many years, there was one thing that I could always count on 100%. Whenever I do a water change, my animals would look better the next day. Remove some of the pollution. Always. I don't even know exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. You know what I think it's like? I think it's like um, the, the water, the aquatic environment that these animals live in, that's like the air we breathe. And think about, you know, like when you're in the winter and you're closed up in your house all winter long, and then you get those first few spring days where the trees are blooming, and green is coming out. You go outside and you take that breath of fresh air and you get that amazing spring, you know, kind of scent. I think that's what it's like for your animals when you do a water change. So for me uh, on this one, uh, I got bitten by the no water change bug for a minute because the ICP thing really seemed to make sense to me. And yeah. frankly, I don't want to do them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and like, well, why change water that looks chemically Perfect. Yeah. The reality is, is uh, it's, it's not necessarily chemically perfect. There could be pesticides or motor oil in there. ICP ain't going to pick up motor oil, you know, and like there's all kinds of different weird things that yeah. can happen in the tank that there could be an enormous, you could have been grossly overdosing carbon or something. Organics. Tank. It's not yeah. going to pick up organics. Yeah. It could be all kinds of stuff in there that isn't going to be picked up. And I, and it's weeks behind too. And so this is what I've just found uh, is, like you can have this debate and you can see a hundred different tanks, thousands of different tanks, but the people that do their water changes regularly are just more successful than the people that don't. Yeah. And I think that it doesn't necessarily dictate what size water change you do, how often you do the water change. People are asking about, you know, a daily water change system, you know, automatic water change system, as opposed to, I don't think it matters. I think is as long as there's some fresh, salt water going in there on a regular basis, I think it makes a difference. I have a theory hmm. that I can't prove, okay. but I have a sneaking suspicion that these molecules that are floating around making the salt water, this is like my, my mad scientist theory, that they don't stay in exactly the same physical form forever. Hmm. And that when you do a water change, you're introducing some brand new, fresh, properly formed whatevers, who knows? I don't know if that's really true or if there's any scientific basis for that. But I go back to that whole fresh air thing. You like to go out in the spring and get a breath of fresh air after the winter. I think that your animals like to get some new fresh salt water once in a while. And oh, I got one more thing about that, which is it is always one of the first solutions when you're seeing some kind of problem. The water change is always on that list of actions that you can take to help figure out and fix whatever's going on in that tank. I would say it comes down to common sense, man. Like I'm dumping food in there every day. And if I have no method of really taking it out, all of it, I mean, the skimmer will pull out some, some other, but yeah. like here is the reality is like, you don't think about it this way, but especially for people who are feeding like pellet foods and stuff is that pellet food is, you know, often corn and you know wheat meal and brewer's yeast and stuff and not products of the sea but on top of that uh vitamin mineral premix mm -hmm. right which means all of that food that like the animal would have ingested the vitamin mineral premix uh when it settles out behind the rock 
It's adding little bits of all those vitamins and minerals every single day, yeah. right? And who knows what the you know outcome of this? But this is the reality of it. If you do the water changes every time, you're successful. Now, this is the part that I, I've like been begging the team to build this calculator because it's actually, to me, really easy. You talked about this in the previous episode of don't chase numbers, manage yeah. trends. So for me, uh, nitrate and phosphate is not necessarily what I'm concerned about. It's that nitrate and phosphate are leading indicators of total pollution. Mm -hmm. So like if the nitrate and phosphate go in there, everything else went with that food too, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and they're leading indicators of all the other garbage that's filled it in there, okay? So now if every single month that goes by, the nitrate goes up, 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 and phosphate goes up, 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 everything else is going up, mm -hmm. up, up. So managing trends. So now if uh, my levels are going up and the pollution is going up, I need one of a few things needs to happen. I need to stop feeding so much but I don't want to go back to the old ways of starving everything because that actually kills animals, right? And like, we're probably still killing more animals trying to starve them right now than we should, especially things like antheas and stuff that should be fed constantly. Well, and the corals respond better to more food going in the tank as well. So then we need to up our filtration game. Mm -hmm. So we need to uh, get the, instead of, you know, putting filter socks in there and just letting them rot, we actually have to change them out every three days. We have to do the, the like, or if you don't want to do that, change it out with a roller mat, yeah, yeah. right? Get a skimmer and actually tune it. Get a skimmer that works, you know? DC ones just work way better than the AC ones because you can tune the amount of air to the organics to create a stable foam head. Once you figure it out, you'll say, where has this been all my life? Okay, but if that doesn't work, then water changes. Mm -hmm. And so this is the piece that I wish we could do the calculator for because a lot of people don't know this. But if you did a 50% water change every single week or every single month, mm -hmm. the levels would never go higher than they would go in a single month. Meaning if over the course of the month, my nitrates went up to 10, I do a 50% water change, they go to five mm -hmm. when I do the 50% water change. Now it's gonna add another 10. Now I do the 50% water change, it would end up at 15. It'll go to seven, uh, seven and a half now. And then it will go to 17.5. Mm -hmm. And then it will eventually end up at two or, or 20, right? Yeah. And then just go down to 10. Uh, and so after the end of that water change, it will never go, whatever amount of pollution will go in there. If I did that 50% water change every week or every month, it will never go higher than I would go in a single month. Now, if I do 30% water change or 35, uh, or like a, roughly 10% to a week, which is a pretty common, mm -hmm. uh, it'll never go higher than it would go in two months. Mm -hmm. So every dumb mistake that I could make on this tank, and I will make many, yeah. uh, won't manage trace <laughs> elements right, and I will put my hands in there to have lotion on them or whatever might happen, right? Yeah. Will never accumulate more than dumb mistakes Ryan makes in two months instead of just dumb mistakes forever, Yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, and so that is the reason why I think that people that do them are just more successful and why we can actually make an intelligent approach to this, which is how do I adjust my water change schedule to match a goal mm -hmm. rather than, uh, you know, just kind of do them because Jerry told me to do this many. Yeah. And then eventually, you know, I don't really know if I want to listen to Jerry anymore because the tank looks fine. But now if I have a goal and I know that I'm just measuring nitrate and phosphate once a month and all I'm looking for is, uh, is it going up or down right. and fixing those trends to find some level of stability instead of perpetual path to garbage. Yeah. Uh, that would be the way. But there's one part of this caveat. Do you know people that are really, really successful without water changes? Because I do. I do actually. Mm -hmm. You, what is one thing about them that you can think of that makes them different than everybody else? I'd be curious if it's the same thing as mine. Wow. I don't know if I have an answer to that. Mine is these people have had these tanks up for four or five years. They're all, nobody's doing this in their first year. Yeah, I, I, I right? think that's probably true of the folks I know too. Okay, and so I think the reason for that is, is now think of the refugium. So the refugium in the back, the catamorph is sucking up all the nitrate mm -hmm. and phosphate, but it's also sucking up all kinds of other stuff, copper and all this other stuff, you know? And then you grab some and you throw in the trash, right? Well, in a four-year-old reef tank, the corals are bioaccumulating yeah. all of that garbage too. Uh, and they're maybe just holding it in their tissue, but they're also kind of exporting when you do for eggs and stuff as well. But like, those are why those people like have just tanks filled end to end 
nitrate problem is I don't have enough. Right. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah, phosphate is a problem. I don't have enough. Uh, it's not I'm growing algae, man. Yeah. But there's also that other thing that you always bring up, which is the tank's doing great. Is it doing great as a five out of 10 or is it doing great as an eight out of 10? Would those tanks that are not getting water changes, would those corals also look better the next day after a water change? And if they would, and that happened once in a while, would that make a difference in the long run? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I fall on the side of, and I, and I said this in the last, in the last uh, taping we did, um, if my corals always look better, 100%. There's very little in a reef tank that is 100% of the time. 100% mm -hmm. of the time I would do a water change, those animals look more engorged, feed her out more, look better the next day. If there's something I can do to make those animals look better the next day, and it always makes them look better the next day, I probably should do that once in a while. I mean, you don't have to do it every week or every month or every two months, but you probably should do it every once in a while if they like it. I, I, I think pick a goal and manage your goal, like whatever it is. Don't just do it willy nilly. Uh, like you're, you're, you're saying it, it, it improves the benefit uh, or uh, they look better afterward. All right, sweet. Then my goal is once a month, it's going to look better. Yeah. Right. But I do it consistently then. There's one thing we, we played this game once uh, many years ago. <laughs> Uh, we were talking about water changes and then there was like, you know, this group of people that advocate for no water changes. And so there's two things that happens here. One is none of us, not just these people, but none of us go out and wave our failures in everybody's face. <laughs> so sure. when a bunch of corals <laughs> die, we're not like, oh, remember all these corals died. Now I do this because I'm on camera and it's just, I, I don't know. I, I feel like I owe it to you to show you my failures more than my successes. But like the average person doesn't do that. I, I don't do that outside of here yeah, right, right. all the time. Uh, I don't want really to show the worst possible face <laughs> of myself. Okay, but uh, also you see when people fail, poof, you never hear. Yeah. You know, they, they just yeah. don't exist anymore. They don't come in and say, like, uh, what I did wrong. Yeah. Right. Uh, and usually it's just like they don't even know. I mean, no, everything just started going south. And yeah, what was working true. Before didn't work before any, anymore. That's right? true. Uh, but we played this one game, which is, all right, so this tank looks like it flourished without water changes from year, you know, three to five. So we go back and you can, you know, look at people's pictures of their tanks. Yeah. And you could look at it and say, all right, there's these corals. How many of those corals are still here? Yeah. Right? Half in most cases. Yeah. Half of them have died along the way. Now, that's true. Water change, not water change. Uh, and it's not definitive to this. But there are also groups of people where almost all of them lived. Mm -hmm. Who should we emulate? Because right. I want to emulate the second guy. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're, yeah. Like, uh, they're not dying. They're thriving. In fact, they're reproducing and growing yeah. rapidly. I want that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right? Uh, so if you're like, we say this all the time, in fact, find somebody, somebody that is doing this really, really well yeah. and just do whatever the hell they're doing. And then one day when you really nailed it and you're like, you know what, man, maybe I want to start off and try something new, then do that, man. But don't start with the piecemeal crap. Yeah. Go uh, to school on somebody. And, and the reality is, too, is if if you ask the right questions, like the people that advocate for no water changes, if you advocate, if you ask them the right questions, which is, do you think I should do this from day one? hundred out of a hundred of them just said, no, that's, that's a stupid idea. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll tell you at some point, but that information doesn't come out unless you ask them usually, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. So uh, uh, there's a hundred ways to do this. It just, I feel that it is on our shoulders when people ask us advice, the way I usually say it is, to give you the highest percentage path to success. Yes. Can't guarantee anything, but in my experience of doing this, in my peer group and everything I've done, this seems to be the sweet spot where everybody flourishes, water change part of it. Right, more, more people are having better success with water changes than the people that are having success without water changes. <laughs> Eight million percent true there, right? Okay, uh, uh, also I'm just gonna throw this out bone out there actually. Some of the people they're doing without water changes, probably the reason they're successful is because they're doing everything else perfect, mm. right? They're killing it here, man. They yeah. are in some ways the people that we should look up to. But unless you're gonna say, man, oh, I'm gonna kill it just like that person. Uh, yeah. 
you now remove the one thing that's going to buffer all of your mistakes. So make that decision. Okay, uh, number two here. How do I, uh, technical calls that he gets, not related to TM, uh, Tropic Marin, how do I lower my nitrate and phosphate concentrations? Yeah, so I put this second because it's kind of related. Easiest way to lower your nitrate and phosphate concentrations is do a water change. You do a 30% water change, you get rid of 30% of your phosphates and nitrates. We talk about water changes not being good about supplementing stuff, but they're really good at getting rid of stuff. So there are plenty of ways to get rid of nitrates and phosphates that are not water changes. But I put it second because clearly the best way and the easiest way is do a water change. 30%, get rid of 30% of all of it. Um, there are other ways. There's, you know, certainly filtration ways to do it. Um, I think the one that I really want to mention is to look at your feeding regime. And when I say look at that, I'm, I mean to look at it in two different ways. The first way is what am I feeding? And the second way is how much I'm feeding. Because if you've got excess nitrates and phosphates in the tank, it's probably coming from your foods. You may find that some of the foods have a lot of phosphate. You can look at the ingredients and see where phosphate is listed on the ingredient list. Sometimes phosphate is way up there because they use a lot of phosphate as a preservative. Guess what? Get rid of that food. Use a different food that has lower phosphates. Your phosphate level will go down. Uh, this is a big, even if you don't look at the math on it, if you use frozen foods over uh, uh, prepared mm -hmm. dry foods, and it might be that the frozen foods actually have a lower ratio of that stuff, but the reality is, is uh, it is way lower. It's mostly water. Yeah. And so when you feed it, it isn't polluting the tank same way, but it's filling the tank with food so you feel good. Uh, whereas if I put the same kind of concentration of those little pellets to make it look the same, I'm polluting the hell out of the tank. So if you just can't figure this out, like there's one thing that's true, is almost every case, is uh, feeding frozen food will result in lower nutrients than dry. Uh, I'm gonna dispute you on this one. Okay, go for it. Um, because one of the things you have to be very careful of with frozen foods is when you look at the analysis on the package, see if it says dry weight or wet weight, because a lot of the frozen foods will list extremely low concentrations of things um, and then extremely high nutrient levels at dry weights, which is totally different than the wet weight of the frozen food that you're actually adding. So be sure to look at that. And there are, I won't say any names of any companies, but there are a few frozen foods out on the market that use a lot of phosphate as preservative. So you wanna be careful of that. Um, so feeding is probably where it's coming from. The other thing that I wanna mention is, we gotta, gotta roll into this, a little discussion of GFO and carbon and that kind of stuff. And my general approach is, and I know you don't, you don't like this approach, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw this out there. Um, I rather not see you run GFO and carbon 24 seven to keep your nutrients down. The reason is that those media, those media, those, those types of things will strip other things out of the water besides what you're trying to strip out of the water. And so I prefer the nutrients to go to the corals rather than strip them out and throw them away. Um, so if you can regulate your nitrate and phosphate level without running carbon and GFO or aluminum oxide or whatever it is you're running, um, I prefer you see, to see you do it that way. So for me, I don't know how much nutrient carbon pulls out, but I use it periodically. Organic, yeah. organic substance. I just pull out, I, I just use it when the water's yellow mm -hmm. or I see a knee jerk problem. Like yeah. the problem, the tank doesn't look good. Perfect. Carbon's first thing. I'm, uh, right, I'm right. bored 100% with you. Carbon doesn't work, water changes the next thing. Yep. Right? Uh, that doesn't work. Uh, like ICP and prayers. Yeah, uh, water changes almost always work in some capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, almost always. Uh, so uh, uh, hunt it down. Uh, you know what? The 160 we were having a problem. You know, I don't know how it happened, but the programming in the lights got stuck on and they were on, dude, for like a week. You're kidding. Yeah, straight. Oh. Uh, I don't know how it happened, man, but like, uh, and, but like we were doing the water changes and the carbon and stuff. Yeah. 
and you go looking for those problems and there's that one, the weird one. But yeah, I go looking for other oddball stuff. So one of the things that I will delineate, oh, the GFO bit. Yeah. I, I use GFO, not per, I, I was a religious user of it in the beginning because I had algae problems in my mm -hmm. first tank and like that just, when it solved it, they never came back and mm -hmm. the tank looked pristine all the time. And you could tell like when, you know, the GFO ran out because the tank didn't look pristine anymore. Yeah. It stopped me from having to clean the glass and all kinds of other stuff. And at the time it was my first tank, so I was a super heavy feeder, so the corals didn't really seem to care either, right? Yeah. Uh, but nitrate levels, man, going through the roof, untestable. Yeah. Like, didn't matter how many times you dil yeah. diluted the test, you couldn't find how much nitrate because it gives you this artificial belief that you mm -hmm. don't have polluted water. Okay, so, but when people ask me, you know, the difference or the, how, much, how do I lower the levels of nitrate and phosphate? What I try to get the mentality here is here, there's two paths. One is uh, like, like the situation I'm in today, which is I have really high levels. How do I get those things down? The other is how do I make that not happen again, mm -hmm. right? Okay, now we're all lazy human beings, right? Uh, and so like I hear like, let's do carbon dosing to strip out all the nitrate and phosphate. Let's use GFO. Let's uh, start Zeovid. Let's uh, use some kind of other, you know, media. Let's start up a nitrate reactor. Let's like, do all these things, right? And so my counsel is, don't do that, dude. If you got a problem with pollution in your tank, being nitrate, phosphate, and all the you know precursors that represents, then how about we do water changes to get it down, and then we use one of those solutions to keep them there. And the reason I say that is because I see people screw this up all the time. And some of these things we don't even know the of net effect of. Like GFO, for instance. Mm -hmm. If I wanted to get the phosphate levels down, I'm going to use a certain amount of GFO. It doesn't work because I got so much in there. And I use more and I use more. And now I got this big old bag of GFO in there. And then finally it gets to zero, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the reason you had that big bag in there is because that was the accumulation of the last 12 months of poor choices. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And you needed that much. But now the person hasn't really thought about this. And so they keep using that much perpetually. Yeah, yeah. But now all you're really doing is you only need this much to uh, you know, remove what you're doing on a daily basis. Carbon dosing, the same thing. I see this all the time. You know, I figure out my dose to get the levels down, you know, whatever odd, you know, milliliters is, you know, 10 didn't work, 50 didn't work, 100 didn't work. I finally find 500 milliliters and all of a sudden that thing, I'm making these numbers up. But uh, I found the dose and then I finally got it down to zero. Well, that got to me zero. Let's just keep dosing that amount perpetually. Okay, well, the reality is, is there's not enough nutrients to support that carbon or there's not enough uh, nutrients uh, and uh, bacteria will probably to right. even support. So. I don't even know what the net effect of overdosing carbon grossly perpetually would be. Okay, now we're doing this as the one that isn't TM products. Yep. And you're forcing me into TM products here. Okay, go so for it. I'm not gonna totally go there, but I do wanna say that this is the big difference between the Tropic Marin carbon dosing program and other carbon dosing programs. So just, you know, carbon dosing, the way that it works, uh, roughly speaking, is most of these products are based on like vinegar or vodka or some kind of like uh, acid. And, and like, it's gonna add, you know, carbon to the water and the bacteria is gonna process that carbon. Now, there's thought processes, then the skimmer removes it. But to be honest, I've seen it work in skimmerless systems. Yep. So there's gotta be something more to it than just that. The corals. Yeah, okay, the corals are capturing, yeah, yeah. eating them. Uh, it's even possible that it's just turning into nitrogen gas too. There's, there's all kinds of things that happen in our tank that we don't know, but it works. You add the carbon and all of a sudden it dissipates. Like I think of uh, 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 like the Red Sea one. The mm -hmm. Red Sea one, I think it, don't quote me on this, but I think you can read the MSID sheet. It's literally like ethanol mm -hmm. and, and, and vinegar, I think. I, you have to go look. But these are simple carbon dosing things that people, a lot of people use. And like NO3 PO, PO4X from Red Seed, tons and tons and tons of people use it. Now, you're about to tell me about something different. And I've been mean to ask them, and I've never asked because I'm not a big carbon dosing person. So tell me why the ones that you're doing are different. So are we going to do this here yeah, on this it. one? Yeah, I don't care. I said it said uh, not related to TMA products, but you're getting a tech, technical assistant call from Ryan Batchelor right now. <laughs> I want to know. I mean, I have this on my other list, but yeah. if you want to get into it now, we'll get into it now. Go for it. So um, the thing that separates the, the Tropic Marin program on carbon dosing is this. What's it called, by the way, the, the, the product you're talking about? 
Well, we have five different products. Okay, That's sir. why okay, it's go. different. Okay, go. I'm interrupting. Okay. So you're supposed to interrupt. So um, the, it depends on your carbon level. Uh, sorry, your phosphate level. I got a little chart over there that I was going to show you during when we explained this. You'll see it in a future episode. But um, uh, so if your phosphate is 0.1 or above, if it's above 0.1 and you're trying to get it down, you're going to use a product that's very similar to like the other products that you're talking about, where it's very aggressive, a lot of carbon uh, going into the system in order to lower that nutrient. The thing the other programs miss that Tropic Marin takes up on is once you get down into that, we consider this the sweet spot somewhere between about 0.1 and about 0.03 or 0.04. I actually have changed my opinion a little of that, and I'm kind of feeling now like the sweet spot is more, more up around like 0.15, a little bit higher, um, and, and down to about 0.04. But once you get down into that range, now you change products to a different product that maintains that phosphate level. So it does some carbon dosing, it adds some of that first kind of product. The first product is a Lima NP, that's what gets it down. Then you go to the NP bacto balance. And what the NP bacto balance does is to balance the phosphate level. It does the carbon dosing because there's benefits of carbon dosing in relation to getting the phosphates absorbed by the corals rather than just lowering it. You're getting it, you're funneling it to the corals through the bacteria. So what the NP bacto balance does is to add a little phosphate and nitrate so that you maintain those levels while you're still doing the carbon dosing. Now, if the level should continue to drop, and let's say you get down to 0.04 or 0.03, and now you're getting down to dangerously low range, now we have a third product called plus NP that actually adds nitrates and phosphates without the carbon dosing. So that now you're, bring, you're always shooting for that 0.1 to 0.04 range. The NP back to balance in most cases is gonna keep you there but if it's not, and you go above or below, you've got a product to get you back into that range. That's the difference in the program. The reason carbon dosing has gotten such a bad rap, and it, it has gotten, so I, I did carbon dosing and I grew a bunch of algae in my system, is because exactly the thing you're talking about, people at a high phosphate level and a high nitrate level, they started doing carbon dosing with, with these very aggressive compounds, got that phosphate and nitrate level down so low that now we allow the bad stuff to grow. Okay, so I haven't used it, so I'm just gonna take your word on this. But so if you're going to use a, if I was gonna give somebody counsel in the future, I would say, all right, if you just want to use carbon dosing to get the stuff down, there's a solution out there called Lima Foss. A Lima NP. A Lima NP. Uh, which will rapidly remove it. Yes. Then switch to a different part that kind of maintains it. Yes. Well. Okay. I don't. I'll, I'm gonna look into the science of this one later. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, but still, for me, use water changes to get all this stuff down. Use uh, the other product to leave them down there. That's because, fine. Because it's, it's the same thing. Whether it be carbon dosing, whether it be setting up your refugium, whether or not it be uh, setting up. Uh, like any solution, your 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 uh, uh, you know your algae scrubber. It's only designed to take out like a cube or two a day. It's not designed to erase the problem you already have. Yeah, the only the only caveat to that is that there's this. Everybody looks at carbon dosing. You know, the the history of carbon dosing is in is in commercial aquaculture. The these guys that have these huge tanks that have a million you know bass in them and they're they're trying to get them to market and the easiest way to get them to market is to feed them like crazy grow them really fast so we can get them out of here the faster we get them to one pound the faster we can sell them those tanks would amass huge amounts of phosphates and nitrates and somebody realized that we could do this carbon dosing thing and get those phosphates and nitrates down with the help of the bacteria so everybody looks at carbon dosing because of the history of it as a great way to lower the nutrient level in the system Mm -hmm. I don't look at it that way. To me, the big benefit of carbon dosing is that the corals have a really lousy mechanism for assimilating phosphates out of the water column, dissolved phosphate out of the water column. 
and they cannot live without phosphates. And so what we do in carbon dosing is we feed beneficial bacteria that assimilate that phosphate, that allow the corals to eat that bacteria and get the phosphate. A really nice side benefit of all of that is that the water column nutrient level goes down. Mm -hmm. But the real important part, the real reason we do the carbon dosing is to funnel that phosphate to the coral polyps rather than throwing it out. I like your approach, but I don't think it's the best because if you're doing that water change to lower it, you're just throwing out those valuable nutrients. I'd rather use the Elimit NP and let my corals eat those nutrients and benefit from it. I'll just say the last bit on it <laughs> is all that stuff makes sense. The water change thing I just know works. Oh, totally. And, and it provides a nice stable starting point to try something new that works. Yeah. And you're a little less mad scientist. And I'll never argue with water changes. Yeah. Never. There you go. All right. Next one is uh, oddly enough, kind of similar in relation to this. How do I raise my nitrate and phosphate concentration? Because this is a, a new part of the conversation. Well, and this is what happens is we, we get the call. It's either how do I get them down or they, they bottomed out. They went to zero. What do I do? Uh, because corals are not going to be happy at zero nitrate and zero phosphate in a reef aquarium. So just like feeding was probably the source of input of a good part of the nitrates and phosphates, Feeding can also be the solution to a low nitrate and phosphate level. Overfeed the tank. It's the cheapest, simplest, fastest, easy way to raise your nitrate and phosphate level. And um, when I talk about overfeeding, there's a, an important kind of factor here, which is to understand that if you put food in the tank, it doesn't matter if your fish eats that and poops it out or that food falls to the bottom and degrades. Either way, it's ending up as nitrates. It, it, it has to. And so um, when you're overfeeding, you're giving the tank a little bit too much food and that's going to help those nitrate and phosphate levels go up. The only thing I'd say there is that the fish does accumulate some of that nitrogen and phosphorus into building its own tissue. Yeah, totally. And metal, blah, blah, blah. But I, I, I'm going to make this number up here because I, but I think that the last time I read about it, it was like 70% actually makes its way through. Yeah. Somebody can correct me here, but it, it's got to be in that neighborhood. Yeah. And, and the, the ultimate point is just food going in the tank input is going to raise the levels. So one of the things though that happens is if I put like a mice shrimp in it in there and it, you know, finds its way behind the sump, it, it's going to just rot and turn into nitrate and phosphate. Yeah. If the fish eats it, digests it partially, and then poos it out, it turns into all these little particles that stay suspended and the mm -hmm. uh, coral can capture it. So there's a lot of benefit to actually the fish eating it rather than just selling yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I will say part of this conversation that like, as I, as I think about this, how do we evolve it to today's standard? which is we talk about ultra low nutrients or avoid zero, zero, mm -hmm. right? Zero nitrogen, zero phosphorus. But what we're always talking about in that is like testable. So we're talking mm -hmm. about inorganic. Inorganic meaning phosphate and nitrate. Mm -hmm. Okay, organic phosphate and nitrate means that like if I drop a piece of uh, food in there, there's, I'm adding phosphate, phosphorus and nitrogen to the tank that way. It's just bound up in tissue. Mm -hmm. Right or bound up in organic matter, so if uh, the the they turn it out, you know, it's the same thing. So we might actually have. I've seen tons and tons of tanks that are zero nitrate, zero phosphate, uh, and they flourish because they're high organic nitrogen and phosphorus. Mm -hmm. What comes to mind again is that old Ziovit method, yeah. right? So yeah. it's like strip it all out using carbon dosing, right? Uh, we'll add the bacterial mulm and we'll pump our rocks and then we'll dose all of the, uh, the organic carbon, you know, via amino acids and other things to the, the tank. So it's actually rich in nitrogen and uh, uh, phosphorus, but just not in inorganic. And the inorganic is like basically feeding the plants. Yeah. Which and, we don't want. Yeah. And the bottom line is with the nitrate, with the nitrogen and phosphorus tests that we do in our systems, if you're running at zero, your animals are probably not happy. No, they're probably not. Uh, you're definitely gonna have to figure it out and do it intentionally. All right, so next one, number four here, is 
things related to a crazy, crazy testing value that end up, oh, oh, uh, end up uh, very likely to be low or high salinity. Yeah, I put this on there because this all of a sudden has come up in the last maybe year, year and a half as a very common call I'm getting. Um, people are using a lot of electronic methods for measuring salinity. And I'm a big fan of electronic measurement because it gets a lot of people measuring stuff that they wouldn't be measuring really on an often basis, you know, very often that they wouldn't be doing it otherwise. So I'm a big fan. However, this particular call, I never used to get before a year or a year and a half ago. And I've taken this call numerous times. So what happens is somebody calls me up and they say, um, you know, my, my calcium level is through the roof. What do I do? You know, my calcium level is, is 580 and I don't know how it got there. I didn't add any extra calcium or my, my calcium, you know, my magnesium bottomed out. It's a, it's 1100 and I, I, I don't know. It's never, my tanks never used magnesium. some kind of crazy number out of somewhere. The I've gotten to the point where now I ask them, what's your salinity and what are you measuring it with? And the kicker here is the very first question can be, if your calcium is through the roof at 580, what's your alkalinity? What's your magnesium, right? If those are also elevated, then it's probably the salinity is up too high. Mm -hmm. If those are not elevated, it could be isolated to that one compound. But I never used to see this before and now I'm getting a lot of calls where people come up with a crazy value. They want to know what's going on. And when I ask them about their other values, they haven't tested them. Then they go back and they test the other values and it comes back equally as high or low. And then we start talking about the salinity measurement method and we find out it's some electronic method. And I always go back to the thing that the only way to really know 100% is with an analog floating hydrometer. Because if you wash that hydrometer, if it doesn't have any salt on it, and you do a test, it cannot read incorrectly. There's no color metrics, there's no reagents, there's no anything. It's a physical property that has to read correctly. So because this has come up so much, even with good, um, you know, really good high quality, uh, you know, um, refractometers. Um, and I, I don't want to get into the problems that I've seen with specific types of salinity measurement. I'll go but, there in a second. But I've, I've seen this with, with all of the electronic and visual types. The bottom line is, get yourself a really good high quality, high precision floating hydrometer, put it in a drawer, keep it really clean. And if you get some value that seems really out of whack, check your salinity with that floating hydrometer before you go chasing a whole bunch of things that may not be the issue at all. Uh, for what it's worth, uh, uh, Travis Rin is one of the only people that still sell a good one of those. So I'll just say it for you, even though you didn't say it. It's actually, um, I, it, I, I think you're, you're, you're correct about that, but this item is on here not because of that. I know. This item is on here because I never got this call before about a year or a year and a half ago. So let me just walk through these because uh, I'll give a, my own counsel, I guess. On this yeah, one. please. Uh, which is... My first thing I ever bought was a floating one. Mm -hmm. I was a dummy and I put it in the tank Oof. and I could never get the damn waves around. Yeah, yeah. like, and this is this is not for me. And I bought a refractometer. Yeah. I would later find out that you're actually just supposed to dip it inside of like a tube or something. Yeah, right? get a PVC pipe and put a cap on the bottom, take yeah. your tank water out, put it in that. Put it in there and, and then it floats. You can find the level and it will be right every time. Right. Like you I don't have to question what it is. Right. Pretty easy to read it, a little bit more work. Right. Mm -hmm. OK. Now, the refractometer uh, for me, uh, if you ever put it on there and like read it and then open it and close it and read a different number, uh, like, well, which one do I trust now? And the answer is the one later, usually because you've actually got a thin layer of water and they, they say auto like temperature correcting. Mm -hmm. Basically, what they're saying is 
most rooms are like 70 degrees. It's a big piece of metal on the end and it's going to absorb the heat from that water fairly rapidly. So, you know, give it just a little bit to t stabilize to the temperature of that thing and then it will do that. But like, I uh, just kind of frustrated and it's kind of murky and I need to go find like a wall or, you know, a window rather. Angle of the light yeah. makes a difference. Yeah. Okay. Then there's the Milwaukee one, mm -hmm. which is the same thing. It's just going to refract the, through the solution. Except for now, instead of having to read through my eye and waiting for the temperature, it actually has like a temperature probe in it and you push the button and it spits it out. And uh, I could use a calibration solution or even RO water if I was wondering. It's like the RO water isn't perfect, but it's, it, if it reads the, that, it's probably going to be pretty You're talking close. about the tabletop one? Yep. Yeah, I love that one. That's the one I use, actually, if I have to do a bunch of rapid testing. Uh, point about that one is a really good technique is to, when you're going to do your measurement, uh, zero it out with your hand over the sensor, and then put your drop in, put your hand back over the sensor, because external light can change the reading. Really? I've never seen that. It, it has a light inside of it, and if you put your hand over it, you get a more consistent ah. reading. Oh, but but that. that's that's my go to. That's my go to one. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the only thing I use. Yeah, I tear it out of my cold dead mm -hmm. hand. Uh, there's no way. OK, then there's this whole breadth of conductivity stuff. OK, people ask me all the time, like, you know, does that pen work or the other thing work? And like, I'm an old curmudgeon on this one because I've gone to enough trade shows and i when i say trade shows i don't mean like aquarium trade shows i mean water quality shows mm -hmm. like globally and like almost everything we use in our hobby is like repurposed from some other water show yeah totally right? like and so uh every single one of them you talk to is uh reading salinity uh, with conductivity with a probe is really really difficult and it gets even more difficult if it happens to be filled with organics like fish turds and stuff and so there'll be a difference in how accurate it is in sort if you like you know had an immaculately clean mixing bin versus measuring it in your tank mm -hmm. you know uh, and you might if you have one of these things you might want to go test the difference between those two uh, uh, and decide whether or not this tool is working for you uh, for me I don't trust it I just don't trust it I, I, like maybe I'm a curmudgeon and maybe technology is caught up and maybe now it's easy and it's affordable. Uh, but like when I'm talking to these people, like like on an infinite budget, could we do it? And the answer is still going to be really hard, man. Yeah. Uh, and I got news for you that we don't have an infinite budget here. People expect this thing to cost less than 100 bucks in most cases. Yeah, I think that for me, the point is that all of these things work to some extent. And um, but it's really helpful to have a, a a zero point that you can go back to. And the zero point is gonna be the analog floating device because, and, and by the way, I'm not talking about a lever arm, uh, a lever arm one, because those are not real accurate on a regular basis. No, those are basis. terrible, I get little bubbles um, in them. But, uh, but, a, but, a, but a high precision floating hydrometer, it's like, you know, going back to ground zero, if that thing reads what your electronic thing is reading, you know you're good. It's what science uses. It's just a good way to, to check your- Scientists your and biologists are using this floating guy. Yeah. Because it's accurate every time. Yeah, exactly. Accuracy, accuracy counts. Okay, so what you said though, though, is like, this is all like at a scale of convenience because mm -hmm. uh, the conductivity pen or the conductivity probe, the convenience factor yeah, is a 10 time. out of 10, right? Big time, yep. The uh, convenience factor of building a PVC tube and floating the water, scooping it out there, convenience factor is zero, yeah. right? Convenience factor of refra refractometer, like maybe a four, right? Convenience factor of a digital refractometer, maybe like now a seven, except for it's kind of big and bulky. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you can pick in there, but for me, the tool that I would use every day, digital refractometer, but I like your idea of if I'm questioning that thing, I could have the floating hydrometer there as well. But more to the point, like if you, to your original point here, if you're having crazy testing values, check your salinity because like a lot of people don't think about this. If you have a 35 PPT or 1.026 and then the thing drops down to you know 25, everything went down, not just salinity, all of the levels. Yeah, are that's way, why you way check down. your other stuff. That's why the first question is if your calcium is super low, you know, where's your alkalinity and your magnesium? If those are not super low, we're probably not looking at a salinity thing where if they are super low, let's go to salinity first because that's probably a solution. I'm going to tell you the flip side also from answering the phones here is when you get something totally crazy, 
that's unexplainable. Like uh, my pH is, you know, five, you know, what's going on? 100 out of 100 cases in that case, man. Testing error. Testing error. error. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm like, there with you. Like the fish would have jumped out by now. And it's you not know? your fault. It's not like, you know, it's not like you did something wrong. It could be a million different things that caused that testing error. Well, it could be the test kit. The yeah. probe died. Whatever it yeah. be. It was just a garbage one to begin with. Uh, and so, I don't know, you just read the instructions wrong. You know, it, it said use two drops and you used four, four, who mm -hmm. knows, you know, uh, or a couple extra drops fill out to repeat the test. Uh, it was specifically with pH, which is one of the most common ones. Like, uh, just go get a, you know, like those little packets, the calibration packet. Don't recalibrate. Just dip the thing in there, swish it around. If it doesn't read, the, if it reads a number that's on the bag, it's good. You don't have to recalibrate. In fact, you're more likely to mess it up now because that thing is actually telling you it's working, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but if it reads something totally off, for a dollar, you found out. Yeah. You know, so uh, definitely that. All right, next one here is, uh, <laughs> this one's funny. <laughs> okay, technical assistant calls, not related to TM. Uh, number five, something like, my calcium is 418. How can I finally get it to 420? <laughs> yeah, uh, you'd be surprised how many calls we get like this. I feel like I must have done this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was Ryan last week. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's just my big point about this one is chase trends, not numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, I talk about this all the time. Uh, there, there's no difference in your tank from 420 calcium level to 410 calcium level. There's no difference. It's not, it's not any different. Um, it, you might even argue that 410 to 430 really isn't different. Um, it, it, it's, if, you, if you add up the inaccuracy of this home style aquarium reagent kit that you're using, the inaccuracy of holding your bottle this way or this way when you put your drop in, the inaccuracy of the lights really bright today or the lights not as bright today, um, all of those things added up, it, it, it's just not giving you a reading that's, that's within that amount. The other thing is your animals don't really care if it actually is 410 or 420. They can't tell the difference. So I always push people to look for trends. Is your calcium dropping? If it is, is your, is your alkalinity dropping with it? Then let's address that. But any snapshot of parameters at any given time doesn't doesn't mean a whole lot and doesn't You're tell you a whole lot. Chasing the difference between 418 and 420. Oh, I, mean, I get yeah. calls like that. I, I know I, because you're told, and and like and there's also people out there saying that it is different, which zero chance. Man. There's zero chance you could test it that well. And like this is probably like a little known fact here, but you know this test kit that you got that you, you spent 15 bucks on. Okay, it went through three hands before you got it, who all made $3 on it. There's only $3 worth of stuff even in that box, man. And that's the only way it could cost 15 bucks in the end. You know, so like we have to have realistic expectations for, you know, the testing tools we have. And I will tell you one of the best things you could probably do is go get like a little, like a kitchen timer or mm -hmm. whatever. So that when it says mix it for one minute, you do it for one minute. You, know, you can do, hey Siri too, uh, yeah. you know, like give me a minute, but like actually do it the way that it says instead of like, oh, it kind of feels like a minute. Yeah. And, and consistency is key. If you're always going a minute and a half, you're fine because your readings will be consistent. But if you do it a minute one time and a minute and a half another time, that's where the inconsistency comes in. And, you know, I hadn't planned on, on bringing this into this, but it, it does bring up another point that I want to mention, which is um, this whole concept of these calls, you know, my calcium's 418, how do I get to 420? A, a big culprit in this is, is ICP testing. Because, um, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm a fan of ICP testing. I'm a, I'm a big fan, but um, it, it has given us the, uh, the, the fantasy that we are looking at these solutions on the molecular level and, and literally counting like molecules and getting down. It's not that close. It's not that specific. There are lots of artifacts in any 
individual, no, don't ever hang your hat on one individual ICP test result. Well, it's also from two weeks ago at best. Yeah, I mean, if you see something crazy, make sure you can reproduce that. Don't hang your hat on one, because there's tons of artifacts that show up in individual tests. Also understand that many of the values that you're given are not direct testing values, they're calculated values. In other words, the ICP machine and results say, well, if this compound and this compound is are these figures, then this compound must be that figure. It's a calculated uh, result. It's not a direct measurement result. We've come a long way with ICP testing for sure. And I think that in many cases, it's really valuable and really helpful. The downside of it is that we get this kind of thing happening. Okay. So let me ask you this question. Yeah. Like you've been doing this a long time, right? You go out and you find out that uh, your ICP tells you that you have a 500 parts per million calcium. Your standard off the shelf test kit tells you have 420. Which one do you believe? Because you, you have to choose. Like there's, this is just a personal choice now like based on experience, because there's nothing proving that one of these is actually better than the other one. Now it's printed on a piece of paper as a report, so it makes it feel very legitimate. Like here's your results, in, but in, which one do you trust? In, in that instance, um, well, the, the simple answer is I don't automatically trust either one. Um, what I would do in that instance is I would do a second calcium test with my kit if I got a similar result, I'd probably want to verify that. I'd go to one of my friends and say, see if he's got a calcium kit, see if I could test it with another kit. If I get a similar result there, I'm not trusting the ICP one. It's either either way, actually, because uh, I, I think this is like, I was just thinking about this in my mind while we're doing it, but if this was happening, it was like grossly wrong. I don't send out a lot of ICP, so this doesn't happen to me a lot. Yeah. But like, and, and if I did, I'm sending ICP out not for calcium levels and alkalinity right. levels from four weeks ago, which right. is of zero value to me. It's where all the trace element stuff were. That's the only thing that I'm really looking for. So I, I wouldn't use it for this purpose, mm -hmm. but let's say I did. If I did use it for calcium alkalinity and it was grossly wrong, first step, mix up some fresh salt water mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then test it using my test kit. If my test kit's giving me the results that are predictable on the uh, on the bucket, yeah, probably test kit is right. Yeah, I like right? that idea. Yeah. Okay. Second is go to the fish store, buy the cheapest available test kit uh, that you can find, uh, and then whichever these two agree with each other, probably correct. And the reality is, is some of these things might be wrong, but as long as they're consistently wrong, mm -hmm. it's okay. Like I go back to the, the alkalinity checker, right? Part of the reason I like the alkalinity checker is I don't really care how accurate it is. It's accurate enough for me because I've proven it a million times and I've done enough tanks, right? But like, uh, that was the big question. Is it better or worse than a titration t test mm -hmm. kit from accuracy? I don't know, but I do know this. It will give it down to like the, you know, 10th of a DKH. And if I had 10 people here do it, it wouldn't vary more than a 10th. Uh, yeah. and, and all of them performing the exact same test. Yeah. Super, super, super consistent, which is more important to me than absolute accuracy. Debate that because some people inside of the, like their OCD is going off. Like, I need accuracy, I need accuracy, I need accuracy. You don't even really know, man, that nine is better than eight anyway. Right. You know, so like. And, and frankly, the difference between nine and eight is negligible as long as it's always the same. Oh. The, the corals are very sensitive to changes in particularly alkalinity, um, but they really don't care on the long-term basis if you're keeping them at eight or you're keeping them at nine, as long as you're there all the time. Mm -hmm. I will say that I do feel like the extremes and by extremes, uh, uh, if you're riding the edge at seven, this seems to be the lowest area for a lot of people or you're riding the edge at like 12. Mm -hmm. Well, accuracy now is a little bit more important to me. Yeah. But if I just like split the, you know, the difference and I'm running like nine, really don't matter, man. Yeah. But even at, even, I mean, I would, I would totally agree with you on the upper end of that. Um, but on the lower end of it, you know, natural seawater is six and a half DKH. If you're running seven, it's probably unlikely that your accuracy is going to be off a whole half a DKH. You know, so you're, you're probably okay down at seven. I would say that uh, if you're using a test kit, it's really unlikely if you're using a checker. Yeah. If you're using a test kit, 
I see people screw those things up all the time. Yeah, uh, I, they don't follow the instructions at all. Yeah, well, that's testing error. <laughs> okay, well, for instance, like we're using a lot of them, and it's like, hey, when it first changes from pink to blue, or is it when it totally changes? Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. well, there's there's a big wane window between when those two things happen. Yeah, I agree, hundred uh, percent. And like a lot of instructions don't even tell you. you know? Yeah. Uh, I will tell you that if it, the instructions don't tell you to explicitly, some of them will explicitly say that when you see the first hint mm -hmm. of the change, that's where it stops. The other ones will tell you, don't say anything. If they don't say anything, it's probably when the whole thing turns over because what's really happening in there is the pH dye had just enough from that reagent in there to turn pink at the top. But as you swirled it, it wasn't enough to change the whole sample. You actually need to change the whole sample yeah. the pH. But like, it doesn't say that. So I don't know what we're gonna do. Well, the other thing you can do when you want to test your test kit is to get a standard. You know, get a get a. In, if you can't use tank uh, uh, fresh made salt water as a standard, get a standard for for either of the parameters you're looking for. Okay, so this is in me. I just don't even trust the standard. Yeah, uh, like consistently. Yeah, uh, yeah. I like I, because for me, like if you buy a standard from like Hawk or something, these things are expensive. Uh, you know, from an actual testing laboratory. Uh, if you buy a standard in the reefing world, they're like five bucks. And the only thing that's going off in my head is like, can this really be done accurately for five bucks retail? Yeah. Uh, meaning you got a dollar into this, maybe, but like, uh... <laughs> test stars. <laughs> Okay, I test our standards. I haven't tested this. I didn't even know you made one. <laughs> yeah, uh, did. Okay, I'd love to try that. Okay, so in your standard, like how much do you get? Ah, uh, it's a you know it's enough to do quite a few tests. It's included in the in the big uh, professional well, the big, test set. Yeah. Oh, cool, right on, man. But uh, we're not talking about I know, we're Tropic to Marin over. today. We're trying, we're trying. Yeah, we're doing our best. Okay, okay. So, uh, all right, my calcium is stable, but my alkalinity keeps dropping. What can I do? Yeah, this is one. Um, this is probably the number one call. Really? Yeah. This is probably the number one call that we get. Um, where people are maybe using the balling method. And so they're using way more part B than they are part A. Or they're using all for E for one of the other products. And, and it's doing great holding their calcium level, but their alkalinity keeps dropping. Or reverse, they're... they're they're using their alkalinity level as the parameter that they're adjusting their dose and their, cal their calcium is going up. This is probably the number one call that I get. Okay. Uh, I used to get this call too a lot. And it almost always was this. It would go like this. It would go, I'm just dosing tons and tons of calcium, man, and it's just not going up. But my alkalinity is just fine. So mm -hmm. kind of the inverse of what you just yeah. said, right? Okay. Like a hundred out of a hundred times, man, it was this problem. It was, all right, dude, I want you to go use the calculator. I want you to like, you know, figure out how much you need to dose to increase the levels, you know, 10 or 20 parts per million, whatever. Dose that much, test it in 10 minutes. Uh, it, you should be able in 10 minutes to recognize that it actually worked and the levels went up. If it didn't, Throw it out because what you put in there was magnesium chloride and not calcium chloride. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 hundred out of hundred times, that was what really? it was. Because they look the same. Yeah. They, you know, like, they're both in these kind of like little blue bags and they both have free flowing crystals in there. And, you know, like when I was mixing it, I just didn't pay attention. And <laughs> uh, so I put two cups of magnesium in there. And if you want to, before you throw it out, you could go ahead and uh, add the magnesium and see if it goes up. Yeah. Uh, but it won't be as concentrated as a normal magnesium solution. So you probably won't be able to test it for it all that easy. But if you're adding calcium chloride and it's not raising the calcium level, it's not calcium chloride in right. there. Yeah. Right. Well, this is a different, this is a different thing. Okay. Um, what this is related to is the fact that there's, there's only a couple of things that can use calcium in your system, right? And the two main things that can use cal take calcium out of your water column are biological calcification of your corals or coralline algae or your, your clams or whatever else is um, building a, a calcium carbonate structure or uh, chemical precipitation of calcium carbonate, which, by the way, can happen in, in tanks where you don't actually see it. You can be getting calcium carbonate precipitation without seeing a white cloud. It can kind of happen in the in the background and, and, and you lose calcium and carbonate that way. 
But the key is, the point here is that those two things that can take calcium out of your system also take alkalinity out of your system. So you see a drop in both. Alkalinity, however, is very different. Alkalinity will be used by both of those processes. But then there's all these other processes that will also use alkalinity without using any calcium. What are they? Well, um, if you get a big ras, it goes under a rock and dies, and he starts to rot, he's going to release acids as he rots. This is the simplified version of, of this, okay? Those acids are going to try to lower your pH. Your alkalinity is going to step in and make up the difference to bring that pH back up. The end result is that that rotting fish or that area of, sometimes it's an area of detritus that, you know, you've got an area that circulates around like this yellow pile of detritus. Do the same thing as a rotting fish. Um, the end result is that you're, you're consuming alkalinity in the system without consuming the associated calcium at the same time. Um, CO2, big one. CO2 in the house. Also, lowers the pH in your tank. Consuming alkalinity. Does it to permanently bring... consume it though? Because like uh, uh, if I add all the, or the acidity to the water, I understand that I'm consuming the buffer, but if I remove the acidity with better aeration of low CO2 water, the alkalinity doesn't change. No, that's right. exactly it. So if you have uh, uh, an area in your house, so CO2 is a heavy gas, sits down on the floor. Most people have their refugiums, their protein skimmers down, on, down towards the floor. Um, the CO2 level on the floor can be high enough that it affects the pH in your tank without having it affect, say, your, your CO2 detector. It doesn't send your CO2 detector off, but it's enough to push that pH down. As it's pushing the pH down, alkalinity steps in to bring that pH back up again. So there's an alkalinity sink happening in the system that's not also using the calcium. So uh, I used to skip this conversation because uh, there's like a lot of science uh, that goes into this. I would tell everybody, if you really want to know, like, you know, like, hey, why does my, why do these things not match? Uh, I, barring the magnesium problem. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I tell, there's an article called, why does my calcium alkalinity not match by Randy Holmes Farley? Go read that if you really need to know. Yeah. Right. But the reality is, uh, dude, sometimes it just doesn't match. And instead of doing 100, 100, you're going to do 110. Uh, and that may actually change over time. And you'll end up back at a 100, 100. Just do it because what, I don't really know what's going on in your tank. Uh, and, and 110 <laughs> to 100 is fine. There's mm -hmm. no problem with that. I'm not talking about a small inconsistency. I'm talking about people that call and say, uh, you know, I'm adding 50 mLs of A and I've got to add 125 mLs of B in order to maintain my alkalinity. You're way off. Yeah. You know, it's a big difference. A little bit of difference, it's actually... The whole big advantage of the balling method is that, or the two-part method, that you can make up for that little bit of difference where in a, in a one part, you can't do that because it's all in one solution. The whole big advantage of balling is you can crank that up to 110 if you need to. So it could be uh, all kinds of things. It could be like with your ESV. You didn't get that big chunk at the bottom actually dissolved, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, and then so if it's not dissolved, it's not in the water. Uh, it could be that uh, with your uh, DIY and the dry solutions that uh, it just so happens that my baking cups, which are not scientific tools, uh, one of them's uh, the third of a cup is actually just more accurate than the whole cup, mm -hmm. you know, uh, or the line in which it's filled. I'm not yeah. reading it right. Maybe eight million things, but the reality is, is who knows if you're just using little bits different. But if you're doing gross, yeah, a little a bit is fine. And in fact, the reason I put this on here is because it is our number one call. And I would say that 50 to 70% of the time, we can find what the problem is and fix it so that that big discrepancy goes down to a very small discrepancy, if any. So I don't think that this is still the same problem as it was when I was on the phones, which is a long time ago. Uh, but what would happen for me, man, is I'd have an overwhelming amount of these calls that were doesn't matter how much calcium and alkalinity I add to the tank, the levels don't go up. Okay. Uh, and 
it was always like, okay, man, uh, how much are you dosing? And they're like, well, uh, and how big is the tank? I'm like, oh, I got a 40 gallon breeder and I'm dosing about 1500 milliliters each, you know? And I'm like, oh man, okay. <laughs> so uh, here's what you're doing is you're adding way too much and it's all precipitating out, oh. you know? And so and not only does it will just not add anything, but all those fresh calcium carbonate crystals that you just made, will actually attach to the ones that were already in there and make a really attractive uh, landing spot and it will actually reduce it over what it was. Kind of like why sometimes when you add sand to the tank, mm -hmm. the sand will reduce the alkalinity and the calcium because that fresh calcium carbonate crystal is really attractive to the ions in the water and it'll actually pull them out. So this is was super common for me. I don't think, I think most people know this now, but it was super common back in the day, which is if you can't get the levels up, it's because you're dosing way too much. Yeah, okay, and then if, for those of you still having that problem now, the best thing you can do right now is just stop dosing today. Take a test, stop dosing, take a, a test, take another one tomorrow at the exact same time. Whatever level it drops is now your consumption. Use the calculator. That is now your dose on a daily mm -hmm. basis. Try it there and you'll like, oh wow, how come I can actually do this with one tenth the dose? And there's reasons because you're dosing too much. Yep. Uh, it was a really common problem back in the day. And if all else fails, do a couple of big water changes and get it back set to zero and see where you happen then. There you go. Yeah, because it could be that all that stuff is still floating around those crystals in there. All right, next one here is, uh, it just says something related, oh, a question related to bad algae and cyano growth. Yeah, everybody, everybody, you know, calls that they've got some growth of undesirable stuff mm -hmm. and they want to know what to do. And the reason I put this on there is because it's just not that simple. The reason you're growing cyanobacteria, the reason you're growing dinoflagellate or, or bryopsis or whatever it is, the thing that you're growing in your tank that you don't want to grow is so related to your tank that you can't email me and say, what do I do? I'm growing this stuff. How do I get rid of it? Because we have literally like a, a, a half hour, 45 minute phone conversation to try to figure out where to start to try to help you get rid of this stuff. It doesn't come up overnight. You're not going to get rid of it overnight. And whatever's going on in your tank that's causing that, whatever imbalance, it's some type of imbalance. There's some type of imbalance. But what that imbalance is, is so related to your particular system that there, there's people always want the silver bullet. You know, how do I get rid of my cyanobacteria? It's just not that simple. So when, when you have some growth of undesirable stuff, do an ICP test. Hopefully you did an ICP test when things were running well so you can compare it. Uh, do a full slate of, of uh, tests on your tank with your home reagent kits to see if you're matching what the ICP test is. When you call, call with a history of where it was. What was the tank doing when you weren't having trouble? What have you changed? Have you changed anything? There are literally a million different reasons why you could be growing cyanobacteria and it's going to be a job to figure it out. So unless you're in that ugly stage of the tank that everybody goes through it, whatever it is, four months or whatever, unless you're in that area where I'm just going to say, do what you need to do and write it out because it's just going to take some time for it to clear up. The tank needs to mature and this is a normal part of the maturation of the tank. Unless you're there, if you're two, three, four years into this and you're getting that kind of growth, be prepared for a long process to figure it out because it's never simple. It can be figured out, but there's some type of imbalance that we're going to have to identify and it's not going to happen. We're not going to identify it overnight. Okay. Can I give you my simple solutions? Yeah, I love them. Okay. So a simple solution to algae is accept what's going on in a reef, which is there's fish in there eating this stuff all day long, mm -hmm. right? There's tangs in there, there's crabs and snails, whatever, but it's the herbivores fish, man. And so algae is a sign of a healthy tank, right? This is something that is very normal to uh, the, the reef. It's not normal to see it because the, el the fish should eat it. Right. So if you don't have a yellow, purple tang, a fox face tang, or a bristle tooth, and think about the mouths too. So like yellow tangs really do a great job now. They're expensive and hard, but uh, purple tang, more and those zebra zomas have different mouths. Then you have the bristle tooth tanks, which yeah. are like kind of designed to like scrape, you know? Yeah. Uh, and like just get all of these fish, the algae just kind of like goes away. But in my first tank, same thing. 
uh, tank looked fantastic. Yellow tank just up and died one day uh, because of not the evil, but just because I did something wrong. I don't know what it was. Uh, and all of a sudden, the whole tank's just filled with algae. And then, like, I was literally sitting there looking. I'm like, you know what? That fish, man, all he ever did all day was eat it. Yeah. And now he's gone and the algae's everywhere. I put the old tang back in, man. Algae problem solved. Yeah, also, snails are your friend. Yeah. Snails are awesome with algae. Okay, another one for me is if you got cyano in the tank, dude, Chemi Clean and a red slime remover. I use a red slime remover a lot. Uh, like, Dude, I've never once seen a negative response to it. Not once in 20 no, years. No, my, my experience with it, though, is that when you when you treat it like that, it, it often comes right back and you're in the same place again. I've had miraculous. <clears throat> nice. And we've, we've used it so many times, mm -hmm. man. Uh, if I had that, I would stop punching myself in the face right now and just dose that. And here's the, the, one, the one cool parts of it. If it doesn't work... It's not cyano, it's dinos or diatoms. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, I think ChemiClean is, is really awesome with, um, with cyano. Okay, so both of them have worked for me. Yeah. Uh, I don't, some people say there's some kind of like sulfur, some people say they're an antibiotic, I don't know. I don't know. Whatever it is. Whatever it is, it works. Okay, now with dinos and diatoms, okay, okay, we found that copepods actually can be a solution to diatoms. Really? Yeah, you know, we had in our experiments here, Tanks are just riddled with diatoms, orange, man. And they've been orange for like months and months and months and months. We added the the like algae bar and copepods, man. Whew, cleared the whole thing up. Really? Okay, and then the reason I added it is because I was Googling like, hey man, what eats diatoms? And I found their dumb website and it says, Di our copepods eat diatoms. And I'm like, well, I gotta try it. Wow. And dude, all of them, all of them, they just totally cleared I'm it up. I'm gonna use that, okay? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So this changed my mind about copepods, which was, I used to think you couldn't prevent copepods from populating the tank. They're going to mm -hmm. come on some coral or something. So I just don't worry about copepods. Yeah. Now I think it's about how do I get them in there at the right time, which is before the lights come on, you know, and I got to figure out some kind of food source for them and stuff. But now in my tank, the 360 you were looking at today, that was the most well-documented giant pain in my butt of my life. Right. I mean, like, this was supposed to be like the coolest thing I've ever done. And it was the hardest path I've ever done and super public and super annoying, <laughs> right? Okay. I watched some of it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, man. I'm like, wow, I, I never had these problems before and these diatoms and dinos and stuff. And I know that because we looked at it under the microscope and it had diatoms and di dinos in it. Okay. And they would kind of come and they would go and whatever, man. And then finally they'll come back. I'm just like, I really was like, I'm turn the damn tank off. And so just start over. I, I don't know what went wrong. Okay, then my buddy told me about some, he had some success with ozone, right? Okay, I turned it on the most minimal time. Like on Friday, turn on the ozone just for a couple hours in the middle of the night, you know, at the lowest possible mm -hmm. setting. I came back on Monday, pristine, dude. Gone, never comes back. Wow. Yeah, okay, I shouldn't say it never came back. I turned the ozone off uh, about three weeks later, or something in that neighborhood. Uh, and then it started to come back, but it didn't come back with the same ferocity. Then I left it on for another couple of weeks and then I turned it off and it never came back. Wow. So awesome. using the ozone kind of like UV as a solution to a problem in mm -hmm. the most minimal way, which is just like a couple hours at you know midnight. Right? Yeah. Okay, you know what this actually matches up to? Because ozone is just extra oxygen. There's right. three oxygens in a gas, right? Well, you know another way that people beat dinos and diatoms in their tank? They dose hydrogen peroxide, peroxide. Yeah, yeah. and hydrogen peroxide is just an extra oxygen kind of in a liquid form. Uh, yeah, you got to be careful when you do that, though, because you can burn the gills on your fish if you put too much in. you got to yeah, be really careful. With both that. of these things. Yeah, and yeah. that's why I put it on the lowest possible yeah. setting on the ozone. Uh, I don't know how much to do with the... Uh, yeah, I don't know uh, either. But I can kind of manage <clears throat> the... Uh, in terms of burning the gills and yeah. the amount of oxidants that are in there, I can kind of manage that with the ORP probe, yeah. you know, and I'm not looking to maintain an ORP. I'm looking to use as little as humanly possible to solve my problem. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So I, I think there are some uh, oh, UV also. So on the 750 out there, we had the type of uh, dino that, uh, you know, creates those sheets, but at night breaks up uh -huh. and it spreads out. Yeah. That type. UV, totally solved it. Turn really? the UV on, done, gone. Well, like, that's more evidence for why I think it's great to have UV plumbed into a system. Okay, just to have it there available. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so now there are people out there that will tell you, uh, well, you're just treating the symptom of a problem. 
Well, yeah, you're 100 percent right. But I don't know what the problem is either, man, because I didn't do anything different right. here. And I've talked to enough people that like, yeah, you do three of these tanks, they work out great. And it, it, it isn't about doing anything that will assure success. Every decision that you make is just about increasing the likelihood of success, mm -hmm. right? You cannot like there's so much magic that's happening at the microbiological level, like the, yeah. you know, the microscopic level here. Like you cannot dictate what's happened. You can only influence it in one way. And sometimes it just goes bad. OK, yeah. but if it goes bad, I can sit there and shame myself uh, and tell me I'm a terrible reefer or I could have already had the solution plumbed in and just turned the damn thing on. And, you know, like, I don't know, that thing didn't go away. Well, right. But I solved it. Flip yeah. of a switch. Right. And if it doesn't come back, you're good. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. For me, cyano, use that little seven dollar bottle. Stop punching yourself in the face. I cannot tell you to go use ozone on dinos and diatoms yet. Uh, I am going to do an experiment where we create these things. And, mm -hmm. and in fact, there's a I haven't showed it to you, yet, <clears throat> but there's an ozone experiment going on right now uh, down the way. And we're cycling brand new tanks. One of them, no ozone. One of them was just a couple hours. One of them with uh, uh, the, the minimum level that people would recommend. One of them with the maximum level that people recommend. And like, let's see what the journey of these tanks are once we turn the lights on. Yeah. I have a suspicion that you're going to say, holy crap, I want that one. And uh, I don't know which one it will be. I assume, I assume the most ozone <clears throat> will keep it pristine and look awesome. I would think so. Right. Who knows? But the answer what I really <clears throat> want is I want the least amount of intervention that achieves my goal. Uh, mm -hmm. So I can't wait to find out. All right, next one here is, should I do carbon dosing even if my nutrients are in a good range? Yes. Why? <laughs> I knew you were going to ask that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because in my opinion, the big benefit from carbon dosing and the reason to do it is to give those polyps a mechanism to get the phosphate that they need. <clears throat> There's a very cool side effect, side benefit, which is that we're going to bring that nutrient, those nutrient levels down in the water column if they were up. But if your nutrients are in, in the range that you want them to be, does that mean you shouldn't do carbon dosing? No. You still should do carbon dosing because that mechanism doesn't exist for those corals to get that phosphate at that concentration. So when you're doing carbon dosing, you're allowing them to get that phosphate that they need, even when you're in the right range. So if there's one thing <clears throat> I've taken away from our conversations so far is uh, I like that idea of taking, instead of having the nitrate and phosphate in the water column, which fuels algae and pest growth, binding it up into the bacteria, which the corals can then capture right. uh, and, you know, get nitrogen and phosphorus in a way it's more similar to the way that it gets in, in the yes. ocean. So, uh, and again, this goes back to me to like Zeovit thing, like 30 years ago, man, we came up with this, but like nobody was listening because it was like special German snake oil. Well, I think, I think there wasn't the, there wasn't the backup science and the understanding of how reefs work at that point that there is now. I mean, we've come a long way in the okay, last so that's 20 the, years. That's the question then. Is did, uh, is it Klaus or Kl yeah. yeah, Klaus over there? Yeah. Uh, okay, so did he know something that all the rest of us didn't know and just wasn't willing to tell? Because yeah, I don't know. the reality is, is like the reason that they protect that information is because everybody will copy it in three seconds and then it's gone. So did he know something that we all didn't know and protect it? Or was it just the result of mad science and this thing just happened to work with all these stuff? Don't know the answer yeah. to that. But like, as we get further along, now, like, I keep bringing that up because it's kind of the grandfather of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, now you're talking about newer methods and uh, you don't necessarily have to punt the rocks, all this right. stuff. But what I did like about that is, and maybe you guys can, I can, yeah, maybe even have this, uh, you can let me know. Uh, I did like about the Zeovit method is when you start it, there is like a book that, you know, like you can go down this book and it tells you how to cycle your tank. Mm -hmm. It tells you the exact days to start these things and how much to dose and whatever. And if you just followed that word for word, kind of like the Nestle cookie uh, package on the end, you will have success, right? Instead of choose your own adventure stuff. Well, this whole, this whole thing about choosing which product to use by the phosphate level, 
is a little bit like that. Mm -hmm. You know, if your phosphate level is this, use this. If your phosphate level is that, use that. Um, it, it's a little bit like that. Um, and and I, I think it works in a similar... In it's, a it's, similar I would call way. it an evolution of that. Yeah, yeah. probably. Yeah. Cool. Uh, all right. So... This one, I can't wait to hear the answer uh -oh. for. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't remember what I wrote on these okay. things. <laughs> uh, this one is, can I run UV while carbon dosing? It's a question we get a lot. Okay. What's the answer? The answer is yes, but you're better off not. Sounds safe. Well, <laughs> safe well here, here's... The, the, I don't know the answer. The, the, the answer is yes. OK, because the the organisms that you're promoting the growth of, this is happening in your in your system. And in, and, and you've got a you know, you've got a UV unit that's running, which is trying to sterilize the water that you're you're mm -hmm. running through your system. And we're kind of depending on this bacteria to feed the corals this phosphate. Are we killing some of that bacteria with the UV unit? Sure, we are. Mm -hmm. Right. We're not killing all of it, though. So you can run UV while you're doing carbon dosing and get a similar effect. The caveat to this is, and, and you know this, and we, we disagree on this, but I'm not a fan of running UV 24 seven in a reef tank anyway, mm -hmm. because my animals want to eat those live animals in the water column. So I'm not a fan of sterilizing that water uh, on a 24 seven basis. I am a fan of having a UV unit plugged in because when you get a bacterial bloom or whatever, you know, dinos. Dino, dinos at this point, and you can just turn a couple of valves and run that UV, man, you, you could struggle with a, with a bacterial bloom for weeks or months where literally a UV is going to cure it overnight. We saw it in a bunch of, especially bare bottom tanks, by the way. If you're gonna do a bare bottom tank, UV is like a really big helper because you see bacterial blooms in the beginnings of those all the time and they can persist. Yeah. Yeah, and what we see it in all of our experiments. They're a bear to get rid of. Yeah, and so, yeah, de definitely in so, that spirit. So the answer to it is yes, you can, but we prefer you not to do that, but not for the carbon dosing reason, just for the general reason that we don't want to sterilize the water in a reef tank. So I don't know the answer to this, but I'll give you like a little bit of an insight that I have. Okay, so there are surface dwelling bacteria that mm -hmm. live on the rocks and sands. And I think that the right word is pelagic bacteria yeah, pelagic, yeah. that lives in the water column, yeah. right? Okay, so there's no question. Uh, the pelagic bacteria is going to be reduced from the, uh, uh, the UV sterilizer. Yeah but it, it shouldn't really have much of an impact on any of the surface dwelling bacteria, which is all the stuff that's actually, you know, in most cases processing all the waste in our tank. I don't know if it's the same stuff that's, I don't know what type of bacteria actually populates from carbon dosing. I don't know that the, that the studies have been done to really delineate this down to the species level. Mm -hmm. um, but I do know people, the, the answer to that question comes from the fact that I know people that run UVs that do carbon dosing and still have good success, you know, so I know it can be done. I know it's not going to, it's not going to completely obliterate the carbon dosing. Is it the most effective way to carbon dose? Probably not, but I know a lot of people that get away with it. That's where like common sense would say, if I'm relying on bacteria to filter my tank and then I have something to reduce the bacteria, well, that's probably not a good move. Right. But in actual practice i also know lots of people that carbon dose and use uv and they've never skipped a beat right so uh i i don't know the answer is yes you can but maybe it's not the best way to do it there you go uh well, so to, to be a straight answer here i guess you know if somebody calls you and said can you run uv and your carbon dosing not best practice but probably still good practice yeah yeah, it's like it's not it's not gonna prevent your success. Right. Okay. Uh no. <laughs> this one, man, actually this one really irritates me. Uh, oh no. Yeah. Uh, is not, that a good thing that I irritate? It's a good you good thing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh because there was so much reluctance to this in the past. 
uh, and it was preventing success. So I have no idea uh, what I wrote it. Uh, the next one here, number 10, is do I really need to feed my corals? Oh, yeah. Oof. So much reluctance to this. To feeding corals? Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the answer to it is pretty simple. Yes, 100%. Yes, you do. Yeah. They can't live on photosynthesis alone. That's been proven a million times. Mm. So, you know, do they get some, some food naturally in the tank and from the water column if you don't feed them? Sure. And will they get enough to survive? Probably, depending on what your feeding regime and everything is. But if we know for a fact that they cannot make enough food through photosynthesis, through the, the help of the zooxanthellae and photosynthesis in order to survive. Maybe we should give them a steak dinner once in a while and let them get what they need and not be like struggling to somehow get it by accident out of the water. Okay, so this is what like, I've heard this repeated like 8 million times, less so in today's world than when I started. But it's, well, corals, you know, get 87% of what they need from the zooxanthellae, and it's only like 13%. Okay, so you got to understand, though, what we're talking about is I didn't give you 87% of a steak sandwich, and then there was just 13% that you missed. It, what we're missing here is the difference between, like, it, these things can uh, produce their own amino acids, and amino acids are the building blocks of protein. Uh, which is the building blocks of uh, tissue production, yeah. right? That's how you okay. grow. But they can't produce them all, right? So they actually need the prey and the organics to fill in the missing links to be able to create the protein, right? Yeah. And in turn, their own tissue. It's like we give you the lettuce and the mayo, but we don't give you the steak and the bread. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> in that steak sandwich. <laughs> yeah, it's like, or just skip the steak even. Uh, so, yeah, I... I, this, and here's one of the pieces where it really came together for me. Uh, another WWC story. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're like, yeah, we use the Brightwell amino acids and everything, you know, and I'm like, okay, you know, I'm still like a little bit special German snake oil, but this one would be American snake oil now. Because mm -hmm. I, like, I really been like, it's been drilled into my head that like, the corals just do just fine without this. And it isn't true because they're actually getting some of this stuff from the food and the poo and stuff. It's just not enough. Yeah. But that's why they're able to survive. And you see a lot of coral systems that have no sources of amino acids and no sources of fish food and very few fish. Those are really hard tanks to keep. Yeah. Uh, they're usually compensating with something. OK. So what they said is like, yeah, we use this Brightwell stuff. OK, we came back here and did an experiment on it. OK. Not only did all the corals grow 50% faster, they calcified faster, their tissue grew faster, the whole thing was faster, they were also twice as colorful. And by twice, I mean, it could, that's a, like a, a made up thing. They were just way, 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 way more colorful. You can go watch the uh, uh, document uh, or the investigates we did on it. Enough said. Yeah. Nobody could ever convince me otherwise now. And with amino acids, essentially what you're doing is like, if you feed the fish poo, it's an organic, and then it's going to actually break the organic down into uh, amino acids and then kind of like reassemble them back as own tissue. Yeah, the, the amino acid thing is really interesting because even like like we've had fish food, uh, uh, coral foods, you know, for for years uh, and, and just now have an amino acid product because the it's a whole different type of nutrient food for the corals that they don't get otherwise. And the, the bottom line is that if you're trying to keep corals, you need to feed them, mm -hmm. period. And whether that means, you know, taking a piece of shrimp and putting it on an elegance coral or putting amino acids in, it's a little something different for everybody. But the answer to that one is definitely yes. And if you're not feeding your corals, they're struggling to get the nutrition they need. Okay, so I'll, I'll bring it back to an, another interesting story that happened to me, which is uh, reef chili. So mm -hmm. if those of you don't know, reef chili was the foundation of bulk reef supply. Uh, I made homemade fish food in my basement, and it just kind of went crazy. This guy right here. Yeah, <laughs> there, there he is, uh, Mr. Chili. Uh, okay, so uh, in that case, uh, I didn't know this was happening. Somebody just called me up and told me one day, but the University of Hawaii did a study on uh, reef chili and a bunch of other coral foods, mm -hmm. right? Uh, to see whether or not the corals would actually grow faster, right? 
Uh, and Reef Chili actually had the, with one of the corals, the fastest possible growth, like by a light year beyond all of them. Reefroids also uh, worked, but then a whole bunch of the other ones actually decreased the growth. Really? Right? So it, just because it says magic fish food on the front, man, I, I don't know. Uh, or coral food, I, I, I don't know. I would look, and the reason that Reef Chili worked was simply that, for those of you who don't know about this story too, the reason that Reef Chili exists is because I made the home, home homemade fish food and I went out and bought all the stuff that you would require to make it. I bought all the golden pearls and the copepods and the amplipods and the daphnia and the silkos and all, all this stuff. And I was like, oh my gosh, man, I'm into this for like 400 bucks and I don't need any of it. And like, <laughs> I just like used this little teeny bits of it, but I'm such a nerd, I couldn't help myself. I wanted to do it. Uh, but now, lo and behold, like, why does Reef Chili work? Because it's just a combination of all the stuff that we've already kind of accepted works. Yeah. You know, and it's all little tiny particulate foods in a wide variety of sizes and yeah. nutrient levels. Now, when I think of amino acids, though, I think of GNC. Mm -hmm. Like, there is eat my steak, eat my broccoli, eat a perfect health, right? Or I can go to GNC and get whey protein. You know, uh, uh -huh. I can get stuff that's like practically kind of like almost digested already and like ready to turn into muscle tissue right away. And that's what I look at as amino acids because you don't have to break down the steak into amino acids to rebuild it back up into it. You're mm -hmm. just giving it to them. And then what I would learn like this year actually was, you know, it's really hard when you're using like those KZ ones, you drop it in there, it's just clear liquid and it like looks like it kind of did nothing. And then you look at the uh, Red Sea one and it's green. Mm -hmm. And you can literally see it coating the coral then, right? Uh, and so like, well, now I can kind of understand, like it's actually getting wrapped in it. But I would learn uh, like later on is the corals actually have an act active transport mechanism for amino acids in the water because the corals are the stuff's decaying mm -hmm. and stuff around them. So they have like a little electrical charge sites that they open up and they have electrical charge sites that pulls amino acid in and then it closes it and then it opens up the charge site on the other side to let the amino acid, this is part of their biology, yeah. is to capture prey like organics, like uh, uh, capture dissolved organics like amino acids. It's all of that. The only part that is abnormal is nitrate and phosphate, mm -hmm. just uh, 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 inorganic. Yeah, yeah. That is the unnormal part. Yeah. Okay. All right. Because you always have a number 11. Because <laughs> I always uh, have one more thing to say. Yes. <laughs> uh, my corals are not good. What can I do to improve them? <laughs> that's yeah. a pretty broad statement. Uh, that's a call we get a lot. Okay. My, my what, corals don't look good. What's the, what do what's I do? the answer to that? Um, you know, I think the answer to that one is um, trying to get people to understand what they're trying to do and and get them vested in it. Usually when I get this call, my calls don't look good. You know, what can I do to make them look better? It's, it's usually from somebody who started a reef tank and didn't really know what they were getting into. They saw a beautiful reef tank somewhere and they thought, wow, that would be cool. I'd like to have that. And, you know, so they set up a tank and and maybe they had fish only tank before, maybe not, you know, and they didn't really know what they were getting into. So when I get a call like that, for me, it's less about trying to get their corals to come around than it is, I'm trying to understand who this person is and what their history is in it. Um, and I usually start by asking them, well, tell me something about your parameters, you know? And very often the reply is, well, everything's in the good range as far as I can tell. At that point, I know that this person is not vested in this. They've not done their homework. They didn't do their reading. They, didn't, they don't really understand what's going on in their system at all. And then we're kind of starting from square one. Because when, when somebody says that to me, um, you, know, oh, I, I, I don't, you know, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I know they're all in a good range. That means they don't know what the range is supposed to be on any of them or whatever. So, so for me, that call is really kind of, where is this person? Sometimes I get this call, and when I start asking about specifics, the person actually knows what's going on. And then we can really get into 
we start looking at the basic parameters and their water change schedule and their maintenance schedule and all of that. And I would say that most of the time, the vast majority of time, when it's somebody that calls and says, corals are not looking great, I don't know what to do, you know, what can I do? And it's somebody that actually has some knowledge and idea of what's going on in their system, we can almost always identify one or two actions to take that are gonna make a big difference, like right away. There's always some big thing that's like not quite happening the way it should. And so, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a matter of finding out who the, who the person is and what are we working with at that point. Uh, if I had to give two generalized things to, my corals are not good, what can I do to improve them? Two things, throw the app on your lights away. <laughs> right. I mean, just set them up and leave them the hell alone, because it, and when I say leave them the hell alone, that, so some people hear that like, OK, well, maybe I'll just change them every three months. Then it, it's been my experience that like leave them alone means don't change them for two years. Like because basically when you're flipping all these switches in there, you're changing like the corals biology needs to adapt the levels of chlorophyll A, C2 and carotenoids and pernitin to be able to adjust to those spectrums and how those things work together. And it will. It just takes a lot mm -hmm. longer than you think it does. So stop messing with your damn lights. Uh, it doesn't matter where they are. Just make it look good and leave it alone. Even if things don't look good now, they probably will look good in 12 months. The other piece, this is the like number one. Like I can't, I wish I could remember who told me this, but the best piece of advice I think I ever heard was, uh, you think you're caring for a reef tank? You're not. You're caring for water and doing that well is just the net result of that is a healthy reef tank. Mm -hmm. You know, so like all That's you're really to trying to do is like maintain this water. And if you maintain the water right, then the net result is this awesome tank that you're super proud of. And you won't be asking Lou about why my corals don't look Well, right. it, goes, it, it goes back to, you know, you got to do some testing. You got to know where the parameters are because that's how you're gauging the, the quality of that water that's in there. You know, people don't realize these animals are, this is their lifeblood. They live in this water 24 seven. Their entire existence is in that water. And, and that's, where, that's where they get everything. They get their nutrients, they get their, their, their health comes from that. Think about, you know, we're in this room and all of a sudden somebody starts pumping some crap in the vents. You know, we start coughing or whatever, because this is where we live and breathe right now. And those animals, 24 seven, they're in the same spot in the same water. If you're not doing everything you can to maintain the quality of that water on a daily basis, you're not giving your animals everything they need. So this circles back to uh, like question or yeah, question one here which is if I'm goal is to maintain water, right? I'm going to make all kinds of mistakes because I'm going to like all the stuff that we talked about today, you're going to screw three of these things up for sure. Uh, and so if that is the goal here, then if I do my 10% water changes every week or 35% once a month, then all those mistakes of my water, my, my attempts to care for the water, will never get worse than they would get in two months. And very few people are ever gonna royally screw this up in two, two months when you're on a way, 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 way better path. So good news is uh, there's more where this comes from. There's an entire playlist that we're building here with <laughs> Lou. You can find it right here and we'll see you in the next episode.